Our own brain is on us now, but she's running the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she has. And she runs the show at the office, too. I mean, I, yeah, I just want to mention something uh, about last week. Uh, Roger asked me that question what do I, you know, what do I want to accomplish? The speaker we had. And you know, one thing we've never done here at Market is bring somebody to raise money. We just kind of said we're not going to do that. And I think we've held pretty close to that. I mean, some people that have come and spoke have ministries, and you guys want to support those ministries, that's fine. But last week, the, the whole intention of me bringing who we did for our guest is just to show us as an example about somebody that's retired, what they can accomplish. And uh, so I just wanted that to be uh, maybe a benchmark for some of us. You know, a lot of us, a lot of you guys are retired, which is wonderful. But there's, when you retire, you got to retire to something, not just sit home and watch over and compute. So that was that was the purpose of me doing that, is to uh, just 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 to have an example. Okay, I also want to announce, and I don't have a lot of information about this. And maybe somebody here also has a lot more than I do. But Harold Bell, who says granddaughter, was stabbed five times last week. She almost died on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, but she did survive. And so uh, I want to make that announcement, make that a an item of prayer for all of you. And then uh, there is a goal funding. Uh, site for her, and her first name is Livia, L-I-V-I-A. I don't know for sure what her last name is. Uh, Marino? How do you know how to spell M-O-R-A-N-G-O? M-O-R-A-N-O. And uh, so if, uh, if you feel led to contribute to GoFunding, uh, M-O-R-E-N-O. M-O-R-E-N-O. So, uh, but for sure, keep her in your prayers. I guess she works at Starbucks and she went out to do something and this guy got her and stabbed her five times. Where does Phoenix? Phoenix. Glendale? Glendale? Yeah. I was in Glendale. So I, I really don't have a lot of information. I just found out about it this morning. So you know when it happened? Was it? 17. The 17th, so almost a week ago. So there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of bad people out there, guys. <clears throat> okay, I also want to announce we have uh, we have a new exciting speaker. Stephen Wilger is. Uh, Employed by SC, SBC, he works out at Bump Hills. He's the group pastor out there. Uh, graduate of uh, Grand Canyon University. And he's working on his Master's of Theology right now uh, at Dallas. And uh, so I think uh, I've heard, heard a lot about this young man, uh, mainly from his wife she worked for us. So I, I, I don't know. Hopefully, good things. I don't know if she's if she's prejudiced or not. Uh, and I won't go into everything, Steve. That's probably for the better. Really good. So, um, <laughs> so let's welcome Stephen. Thank you. Do I need a mic? Can you guys hear me in the back or or would that mic be helpful? A mic? These are old guys. They can't see or hear. We can't see or hear. 
Well, thank you so much, Dave, for that nice introduction. Like he said, my name is Stephen Widger. Uh, a little bit about myself, I guess. I'm a born and raised Phoenician, so I'm, I guess, a little bit of a rare breed nowadays. Uh, I grew up here in Arizona. I did go to GCU. I double majored in Christian studies and business management. Uh, right now, I am working at Scottsdale Bible Church. I've done. I've been at three different campuses. I've been at Northridge. I've done small groups and young adults there. Uh, I led the young adults uh, community for about a year and a half uh, at the Shea campus, and now I'm doing groups ministry. Okay, we put a little bit closer. Um, and now doing groups ministry out at Fountain Hills. And then, yes, how I did get the invite here was through my amazing wife. She does work with Dave. And I'm super actually blessed to be here today. And with coming here today, um, I was kind of thinking, about, okay, what, what does God have for us here today? And uh, a question popped in my head. And a question, or a question from an old book that I actually read. And the question is this. If you could define your life by a moment, what would it be? If you could define your life by a moment, what would it be? Like if you could take a moment, and you could seize every opportunity out of it. Like you could squeeze every ounce out of it, almost frame it in a picture. What would that moment be for you? Take a moment and think about it. Because for you, maybe it was when you got married. Or maybe it was the first time you heard your, your child cry. When you got to hold her or him in your arms for the very first time. And you got to understand, you know, this is someone I get to care for someone I get to raise, someone that I get to be a part of their lives. Or maybe for some of you here in the room, it was like a business transaction or starting your business. Or maybe for you, it was when you came to faith and you recognized that you were a sinner and that you were in need of a savior. But more importantly, you saw how your life began to change because of that moment. You saw how your life and your trajectory of your life began to change. I don't know what your moment is exactly. But when I started to think about myself, a couple of different things popped into my own personal mind. The first thing was asking my wife to marry me. That was like a courageous moment. Like, hey, not only is this going to be something that takes a lot of faith, uh, but something I knew that was going to change my life forever. Uh, another moment that I guess I didn't recognize how important it was, was becoming a life leader at GCU, which basically was just leading a small group, leading a group of guys um, but it kind of set the trajectory and made me really realize I love to teach and that I really do want to go into ministry. And then at all, that moment also led me actually to go to Scotland for two months, um, where I was actually worked as an intern at Scotland for a church there. And it kind of changed my trajectory because Scotland, I don't know if you know this, is only three to five percent Christian. And it made me have this passion going, OK, if Scotland's only three to five percent Christian, which most people don't know about, um, I got told by my mentor before I went there, if you want to know where the U.S. church will be in 15 to 20 years, look at where the Scotland is today. And I was like, okay, okay, if I can do anything in my power to be able to say, you know what, I don't want this to happen to my home, my, like to the U.S., like I want to help be a part of that. So I kind of came back with a more of a passion and a trajectory that says, Lord, like if I can be any form of a mission, if, I, if you can use me in any way, this is what I want to do. And these are the things, again, if you could have a moment that could define your life, what would it be? But then another question got posed to me. That if you could take a moment, seize it, squeeze it, take every little ounce out of it, put it in a fixture frame, shouldn't that, that moment be in the future and not in our past? Like, if we really believe our God is who he is, shouldn't we be looking forward with more and hope and defining our lives by a moment that how he will take place? Because I don't know about you. The moments I think about the most are my past. The moments that I think about the most are my past, and specifically the moments I think about the most about my past are my past mistakes. The ways I've let people down. The way I've, I've let my spouse down. My friends down. My coworkers down. And it's in this that kind of, God kind of laid this kind of thought in my mind. It's like, Widger, what if you change your perspective? What if you look to others and look about your future and look to this moment as something here in the future? Like, what if I actually believe that there was a moment out here in front of me that could possibly change my trajectory for the rest of my life. 
how would I change, how would that change the way I live right now? And probably more importantly, how would I prepare for it? Because what I began to realize is how I prepare for it, how do I prepare for this future moment? Is by seizing the moment right here in front of us. Is by seizing what we have here in front of us today. And this is kind of my hope and my goal for us today is that we could look forward in hope by seizing what God has laid in front of our hands today and by trusting in who he is. So what, the way we're going to do that today is we're going to, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going we're gonna to go into a lot. So you're going to need your Bibles. Take out your phone. If you have a hard copy, I would take it out. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14 mainly here today. And we're going to look at a character named Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan's in the Bible. A little bit about him is he's the son of King Saul. He, King Saul has at this point, yeah, First Samuel chapter 14, Samuel has, or Saul has just become king and they're kind of find themselves in a difficult situation. The Israelites have at this point where we're jumping in the story has 600 men and they're about to go up against a Philistine army that has 3,000 chariots and as in verse 13, or in, or in chapter 13, it says, in as number of men as there are sand on the seashore. And here is the Israelites. They're kind of scared out of their mind right now. They've been hiding in caves. They finally find themselves out of the caves, having the courage enough. They find themselves kind of in this situation that we're going to read about here, that they're up against the hill, and the Philistines are on top of the hill, and they're down below in this valley. And what I want us to read about is how, what, what I'm going to call, how does Jonathan seize these divine moments, these moments in our lives that possibly change the trajectory of not only our lives, but also the lives of everyone around us. So I want to look at that, but I also want to look at this question is again, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to read the story, but then after reading it, I also want to ask this question is, how does Jonathan prepare for that moment? Like, how was Jonathan able to accomplish this? So, but first, we got to, again, we got to read this passage, and we got to look at what is actually taking place here. So, again, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. Um, it's in the Old Testament, kind of near the beginning of your Bible. Um, we're going to be in chapter 14, and I'm going to start reading in, I'm going to start reading just in verse um, 1. And it says this. So, one day, right off the bat, just, this is not a special day. This is not anything that I guess he quote-unquote planned. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father, who was King Saul. So Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And with him were about 600 men, among who was Abijah, who was wearing an ephod, which was basically just the priest's kind of clothing that they would wear. That's what it was called. And he was the son of of Achobad, brother of Ahitatub, son of Phineas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest, and Shilah. No one was aware that Jonathan has left. On each side of the path that Jonathan intended across to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, and the other was Sina. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other to the south toward Giba. And Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come. Let us go over to the outpost to those circumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord by saving, whether by many or by few. His armor bearer looks at him and says, You haul you have in mind. His armor bearer said, Go ahead. I am with you in heart and soul. So Jonathan said, Come on. We'll cross over towards them. And let them see us. If they say to us, wait here until we come to you, we will say, well, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say to us, come up to us, we'll climb up because that will be a sign the Lord has given them into our hands. I just want to pause there for a moment because here they are. Um, and they're facing again. Astronomical odds. And one also really important fact that I didn't mention there's only two swords the entire nation of Israel has. So they're going up against men that 
have chariots, swords, and in the meanwhile, the only two people with swords at this point are Jonathan and King Saul. Everyone else at this point is sharpening all of their farming tools. They're literally going and sharpening their, their rakes, their hoes, anything that they basically can't. These are the weapons that they're planning to go fight against the Philistines. So Jonathan says, you know what? I have a sword, I have an armor bearer, and I know who my God is. So he's like, okay, I got a brilliant idea, armor bearer. We're going to go up, and we're going to see those guys up there on this, this hill. I have a great military strategy for you. You ready? We're going to reveal ourselves to them. And there's only going to be two of us, and there's going to be a whole group of them. And we're going to purposely do this. We're not going to sneak up on them. We're not going to try to, like, attack them by surprise. We're going to reveal ourselves to them. And guess what? If they tell us to stay, we're just going to listen. Oh, but if they tell us to come up to them, we'll know the Lord's delivered them into our hands. This is where Elijah, This is where Jonathan finds himself. I don't know about you, but like, that's co- military strategy. I'm not a military expert, so I can't really say exactly. But I'm like, this doesn't seem like either great odds, neither like a great strategy, but it's seemingly that he has greater trust in who God is than necessarily what's going on, despite all the odds. So keep reading with me in verse 11. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outposts. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are, are crawling out of the holes that they were hiding in. Again, they were, if you read chapter 13, everyone's afraid at this point. It says, the Hebrews are crawling out in the holes they were hiding in. The man at the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we will teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. So Jonathan climbed up, using his hands and his feet, and with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about half an acre. Continue to read in verse 15. And then a panic struck the whole army and those in the camp and the field and those in the outposts and the raiding parties and the ground shook and it was a panic sent by God. If you jump down to verse 20 with me, it says this, and then Saul and all his men assembled and went to battle. They found the, the, the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. And those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines had gone up with them to their camp and went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. And when all the Israelites who had hidden in the valley of the country of Ephraim heard the Philistines were on the run, they joined in the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel, and the battle moved on beyond Beth Haven. So here we have Jonathan again. Only got, or there's only two swords. He goes up, he, he conquers 20 different men in an area of about half an acre, it says. And this leads to a complete panic that now, yet, the, even though no one has swords, they start fighting against each other, and God brings this amazing, great victory. And when I read a story like this, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm inspired. I look at the faith and the courage of Jonathan to see despite the odds, despite seeing 600 men, despite being the only one with a sword, his own armor bearer who followed him, he doesn't even have a sword. And yet God brings this great victory through him. And when I look at these stories, I'm like, I, I want more of what Jonathan has. I want to be a man of courage. I want to be a man that steps out in faith, trusting in who my God is. And that's where, again, I have to ask the question here today. If that's the case, like, how did Jonathan get to this moment? How did he seize these moments that were right here in front of him? How did he prepare for it? And that's where what I want us to do, if you have your Bible, was I actually want to turn with me. We're going to go back two chapters. Because we don't get a lot about the person of Jonathan, honestly, in the Bible. We only see him mentioned about five, six times uh, throughout the Bible. Um, and this is where I'm like, okay. How are we going to figure this out? And I started to read a little bit before. And what I'm going to do is kind of do the same thing. Is I want to walk through what I'm going to see in 1 Samuel chapter 12. A little bit about actually Samuel. So I got to just tell you who Samuel is. 
Uh, Samuel is the kind of the judge at the time, the leader of Israel, and he's also the priest. He's been the one guiding them not only uh, as a leader of the nation, but also leading them spiritually. And here in chapter 12, or in the previous chapters, uh, the nation of Israel has been calling out for a king. They've been saying, hey, we see every nation around us. They have a king. They have a guy that's kind of leading them. We don't have that guy. We want that guy. And they kind of plead to Samuel, and sure enough, God kind of gives them this king um, because, I guess, innately they want it, not that they should have it. And we're going to see that here in a second. But in 1 Samuel chapter 12, this is uh, Samuel's kind of final message to the people of Israel, it seems like. His final kind of goodbye. Kind of in the beginning of chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse 6, is kind of him basically saying like, hey, I want to make sure we all agree to this. I didn't do anything wrong. I led you rightly. Like, I'm like, I have not deceived you in any way. And the people say, yes, like we completely agree to you. And then here where we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 6 or 12, verse 6. Samuel says, okay, we're going to, these are my kind of my final parting words. So if you, again, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me. We're going to be in chapter, we're going to be in verse 6. And then it says this. Uh, and then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. So now then, stand here, because I'm going to confront you with the evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. So here he is. He's going to be like basically saying, okay, I'm going to present this to you about all the ways that God has shown up in your life, not only in your lives, but also in the generations past. And when, and when reading these next couple of verses, what I want us to look at is notice kind of there's going to be a kind of a trend, I guess, or a theme. We're going to kind of see this back and forth. And I kind of want to just, we're going to see a back and forth between two different aspects that I want to point out to you. So continue to read in verse 8. It says this. So after Jacob entered Egypt, they cried out for the Lord for help. And the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, and who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled in this place. So here it is. The Lord tells Jacob to go into the Egypt. This is the story of Joseph. Um, there's a famine in the land. Egypt is the only place that actually has food. They go into Egypt. And then after being there for a while, the Lord hears their cries. They've been now, they're in slavery, and they hear their cries, and the Lord sends Moses and Aaron to them. God rescues them and brings them out. And then look at verse 9. Look at what the people of Israel do. After the Lord saves, saves them, it says this, but they forgot the Lord their God. So he sold them into the hand of Caesarea, commander of the armor of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines, and the king of Moab who fought against them. So here it is. They find themselves, and again, they forgot the Lord. They are delivered into someone else's hands. And then, look in verse 10 again. What did they do again? And they cried out for the Lord for help, and saying, We have sinned. We have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and all the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hands of your enemies, and we will serve you. So they find themselves in a difficult situation. In Egypt, the Lord comes and saves them. They forget about the Lord. The Lord delivers them into the hands of someone else. They, again, they cry out for help, and the Lord says, Okay, you're in help. You're my people. I'm going to again. I'm going to send someone else. And here we have now in verse 11. And the Lord sent Jerubbaal, Barak, Jephthah. And Samuel, and he delivered you from your hands and all the enemies around you, so that you lived in safety. I want, I want to pause here a moment because I think this verse is actually kind of a key verse. Because I want us to notice something. He names four different men in this story. In verse 11, he sent Jerub, Barak, Zephath, and Samuel. And you're asking me, okay, why is this important? And probably also wondering, who are these guys? Um, because I had first kind of, when I read this at first, I just jumped over it. Well, that first guy, the Drew Bill, this is actually Gideon. Uh, it's a different name for Gideon. And Gideon was a judge. You see him in First Samuel chapter 4 through 8. Or sorry, in, in Judges, about chapters 4 and 5. But what do we, I made me ask, what do we know about Gideon? What do we know about his story? <clears throat> What we know about his story is that it's actually something kind of really unique. Gideon finds himself fighting against the Midianite army. 
and he goes to raise up a group of men. At first, Gideon is scared out of his mind. He wants nothing to do with this, right? He tries to give God all these signs, trying to be like, I am not your guy. I'm not your person. Please choose someone else. I'm from the lowest tribe, from the youngest of all of my brothers. Like, I am not your dude. And God says, no, you're the one I want to use. He says, gather again, uh, together some men. So at first, they have 32,000 men. And God looks at them and goes, that's way too many guys. Like, you, you, we need to cut this down again. Military strategies don't make sense. And so God goes, okay, we're going to cut it down. Initially, cuts it down, then 22,000 men leave, and 10,000 are left. And God goes, you still got too many guys. So he says, okay, we, I want you to go to the water. Anyone that laps their uh, water like a dog, those are your guys. Again, military strategies, fantastic. 300 guys are left. And God's like, these are the guys I want you to use. And how do they end up going to defeat the Midian army? Does anyone remember? No, no, that's a different one. That's Samson. It was ram horns. It was ram horns that they started to blow. Why is this important? They don't have a weapon. Where's Jonathan here in the story? Who's the only guys with swords? Who doesn't have weapons? God used Gideon with 300 men with no weapons to now go defeat the Midian army. And right here in the story, you're probably asking, how does is Jonathan hearing this? Well, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, all of Israel is there, in which... He's kind of, again, his final thing, anointing King Saul. Jonathan's most likely there. He's the king's son. But then we continue to read. So we have Gideon again. And you're like, huh, okay, who's Gideon? Um, so when we look at the next story, we look at the story of Barak. What I find interesting about Barak, he is a guy, he's, he's also in Judges. He's also with the story of Deborah, if you know who Deborah is in the Bible. Um, but they find themselves against the Caesarea army. And guess what? They have 900 chariots. Israel at this point has no chariots. Remember how many chariots the Philistine army has at this point? They have 3,000. So here again, they find themselves in a situation where strategically in what these armies have, they have a lot more than we do. But God uses Barak despite the odds, despite them having 900 chariots to go into this place, and he ends up defeating them. You look at the next guy, Jephthah. He's a guy, he's a kind of an outcast. He's a person that you see him in Judges chapter 11 and 12. He's a guy that actually was kind of set off by the nation of Israel, being like, hey, we don't really want you. And then in time of a great need, they're like, hey, we need you back. <laughs> so they bring him back. He ends up leading, and he conquers 20 different cities. But then you also get the person of Samuel. And I find this kind of interesting. Because in my translation, and maybe in yours, it kind of gives a little asterisk mark. It says that maybe this is possibly also Samson uh, in the Syriac kind of version of the Bible. It seems to be translated that way. But the, it is most likely uh, Samuel in this text. But it, what it made me realize is they're only mentioning one dude. It's either, it, regardless if it's Samson or it's Samuel, he's only mentioning one guy. And what is it that Jonathan says at the beginning of this? Do you remember what he said in the, when he fought the battle? And he said to his armor bearer, let's go up to him. And the Lord maybe will save us by many or by a few. So here in the story, these four guys that, Sam, that Samuel specifically mentions is a story that 300 guys with ram horns defeated an army with no weapons. A story that they had a lot more chariots, a lot more army, a lot more strategy than they did, and God delivered them. A guy that was an outcast that wasn't probably the ideal guy that he said, you know what, I'm going to use you to conquer my people. And an individual that says, I'm going to use you to lead my people. So God takes odds that seem against him, weapons that they don't have, 
people that are outcasted and individuals that God wants to use and says, hey, these are the people that Samuel says, I want you to remember these people. I want this to be the motivation factor for you looking forward in confidence in who I am. And this is kind of, again, this is the context of the story that comes right before. But then, what time is it? I want to make sure I'm good on time. I want us to continue reading because look at this. Because we're not done yet. So this is the context, a little bit of background. But if you read with me in verse 12, Samuel kind of warns them of something. He says, but when you saw the Nahash king of the Ammonites was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set the king over you. And then notice in verse 14, it starts at least in my NIV translation with an if. It says, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, if you rebel against him and his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. So here it was, what basically what he is trying to press these people into is, we can, I can give you a king. God can give you a king. But your faith, your trust better be more in God than it is in your king. And look at this in verse 16. And now, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is not wheat harvest now? I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did and the eyes of the Lord, and when you asked him for a king. And then Samuel called on the Lord, and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain, so the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. So here it is, the people are seeing God move in a pretty magnificent way through Samuel, and then as a result, look at what the people said in verse 19. The people all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants, so that we will not die. For we have added to our other sins the evil of asking for a king. They realize their own sin, which I think this is kind of important. Um, but also notice the same response in verse 20. It says, don't be afraid. You have done evil. You've done all this evil. But notice what he presses them into. He doesn't shame them for their sin. He acknowledges their sin. He doesn't shame them. But then it says, despite what you did, despite what took place in your past, what I want you to do here today is this. Do not turn away from the Lord your God, but serve the Lord your God with all your heart. Do not turn away after your useless idols. They can do you no good. And then I have underlined this in my Bible. Nor can they rescue you because they are useless. Why that stands out to me is he obviously is mentioning idols. But what was the nation of Israel in these previous versions idolizing? A king. And it says, nor can they rescue you. These idols are these things that we kind of put above and then we kind of put on these high pedestals. They can't rescue you. But verse 22 says, so for the sake of the great name of the Lord, will not reject his people because the Lord has pleased to make you his own. I'm just going to pause here for a moment because I want us to notice something throughout this entire story. God hears us. He hears our cries. Like, I don't know about you, but like sometimes we can question whether God actually hears us in our pains and our struggles when we don't see God show up maybe in exactly when or how or why or how we want him to. In this story, one thing we can have confidence is that he hears us. He calls us his own. We are his children. So in verse 23, it says this, As for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord, by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. And these are the final words 
kind of the drop of the mic that Samuel gets to leave with the nation of Israel. And also probably something that what I am leaning towards is saying, this is kind of what Jonathan also heard. So now knowing this, looking at the story now through this perspective, I want us to reread 1 Samuel chapter 14. So here they are again. They're going against the Philistine army. They got 3,000 men. They have a more, they have 3,000 chariots. They have more men than the sand on the seashores. Saul and Jonathan are the only one with swords. And this is what Jonathan does. In verse 1, one day, again, doesn't seem like there's necessarily a plan. Doesn't seem like there's necessarily a strategy. Sometimes the ways we work with God is like, hey, God, I have a plan. I have a purpose. I need this to go this way. It seems that it's just one day. That God sometimes doesn't work in the orchestrated, all the the five-year, ten-year plans. But God says, you know what? This one day is the day that I'm going to use. And Jonathan says, okay, one day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Why didn't he tell his father? He knew that God was going to rescue him. It wasn't the king that necessarily was going to rescue him. It was the Lord that was going to rescue him. See, here in this moment, Jonathan was, tr- was not choosing how he would die. He was choosing how he would live. He was choosing, he says, on this day, I'm going to step forward in faith. So Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeon under the pomegranate tree. We look in the previous chapter, Saul was scared out of his mind. So are all the men. That's why they're hiding in caves among whom was wearing an ephod. He was a son of Ishbash. Um, and I'm going to jump down to the end of the verse. And no one was aware that Jonathan had left. So on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost on the cliff. One was called Boaz and the other Sina. One cliff stood to the north and toward Michbash and the other toward the south towards Gibba. And then Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go up over the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder from saving the Lord, whether by many or by few. He knows the stories of Gideon. He knows the story of Samuel. He knows the story of of Jephthah. He knows how the Lord has provided. He knows that he doesn't need a weapon. He knows that if God wants to show up and he's going to provide, he's going to do this. Because here in the verse, what I kind of find interesting is it says, perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will, will save us. Which seems like, is Jonathan wavering? Is he, is he questioning? And what I, after doing a little bit of studying, what I personally believe is, the reason why he says perhaps is it's not questioning if God is going to show up. The question is just how. He knows who his God is. He knows that he's faithful, that he's trustworthy. He's saying perhaps because he doesn't exactly know. He doesn't know that the Lord is going to send the here now in the story in a little bit the ground to shake, the, 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 they're going to fight each other. He doesn't know any of these things. So he says, perhaps the Lord is going to show up, but he has a sense of confidence and assurance, knowing, guess what? My God showed up for my people in the past, and he showed up for me here now. And then what he does that I find really interesting, he says this to his armor bearer. And look at what his response is. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you in heart and soul. Put yourself in the shoes of this armor bearer. You have a lot of trust in one man. Because now it's your life also. But what does that show us? It shows us the power of influence. I don't know about you, but some of the most inspiring people in my own life that I've seen are those that have a passionate courage and a passionate confidence of knowing who God is and what their purpose is. Those are some of the most contagious people to ever be around. And in this armor bearer, only guy that probably also Jonathan actually had under his control and under his power because Saul gave him this sword as the king. So he, the only one that he probably has the power to influence or basically the only person that he has the power and the authority to say, you're with me. He asks them, will you come? And the guy's like, wherever you go, I will go. There seems to be a sense of confidence, of courage in Jonathan as he steps into this. So look as we continue to read. So Jonathan said, come on then. We will cross over towards them. 
and let them see us. If they say to us, wait here until we come to you, we will say, we, are, it's, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come on, come up to us, we'll climb up because that will be our sign the Lord has given them into our hands. See, what at first seemed like a really bad military strategy was not a bad military strategy because God doesn't work in those confines. He doesn't work in the, the, the normal ways in which normally militaries work. He's like, it doesn't matter. Like if they tell us to stay here, we're just going to trust that the Lord has us here. Because again, he could save by many. He could save by the 600 men that we have. Or he could save by a few. So if these men tell us no, okay. But that's just a sign to us that this isn't maybe our direct moment. But if they call us up, we will know the Lord has delivered them into our hands. Verse 11. So both of them showed themselves the Philistine outpost, look to the Philistines. The Hebrews are crawling out of their holes they were hiding in. The men in the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they said, come up to us and we will teach you a lesson. If I'm Jonathan in this moment, I'm probably smirking. I'm like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fight. The Lord has delivered them into our hands. And sure enough, so Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me, follow me. Be the person that steps forward in faith and confidence, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And so Jonathan climbed up, using his hands and his feet. Seems like a little bit of a hard crawl. And he says to this, The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they followed, and they killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed about 20 men in an area about half an acre. And then the Lord does what he does best. Then panic struck the entire camp. And those in the camp, in the field, and those in the outpost, and the raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. And down in verse 20, or actually I'm going to read verse 16 now. It says, look, Saul looks out at the Gibeon and Benjamin and saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, muster your forces and see who has left us. And when they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer. So Saul said to Abijah, bring the ark of God. And while Saul was talking to the priest, and the, the tumbling in the Philistines' camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. And then Saul, with all of his men, assembled, and they went into battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion. They were striking each other with their swords. And those Hebrews, who had previously been with the Philistines, and had gone up to their camp, and went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. And when the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard the Philistines were on the run. They joined the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel. And the battle moved beyond Beth Haven. I know about you, but I want to be defined by a moment like this. Then when we ask ourselves the question, what is the moment that you want to define your life by. I want a moment like this that says, you know what, God, I need you there for me to show up. That if I have an expectation or a goal that I can do on my own, guess what? It's probably too small. And Lord, my prayer is when I do this, is when you get all the credit. Because look at verse 23 again. So on that day, who saved Israel? The Lord saved Israel. Jonathan didn't. His armor bearer didn't. The men that followed didn't. Because back in chapter 12, what did we learn? It's the Lord who rescues. It's the Lord who saves. So again, my question I have for you, if you could have a moment that you could seize, that you could take every single ounce out of, that you could look, that you could say, you know what, I'm going to frame this in a picture. Is this a moment in your past? Or do you continue to have hope and confidence in who your God is that looks forward and hope and says, God, will you still continue to use me moving forward? Would I be the man? Would I be the husband? Would I be the father that you're calling me to be? Would I set the example of what it looks like to boldly step out in courage, to boldly step out in faith, to say, you know what? 
I'm going to lead in such a way. I'm going to walk my life in such a way that those around me, when I see my armor bearer, when I have those people of influence that are around me, that says, guess what? I'm living my life in such a way that even though it's crazy, even though the odds are against us, when I ask someone, hey, you want to follow me? They're like, I will follow you with my whole heart and my whole soul. Why? Because I'm following after God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. What would it look like? What would be the effect that it would have on your family? on your grandkids, on your kids, if we continued to walk out in faith and in confidence in who our God is. So this is kind of some thoughts I want to put into your mind is this. Do you have some of these moments? Not that past moments are bad, because what does Samuel do? He holds on to past things that give him confidence about future. He goes to these four people that allows him to have the sense and the confidence, or actually technically five, he also mentioned Moses and Aaron, but he tells these stories of like, this is how God has shown up in your past, so guess what? You need to continue to have faith and trust in him. Do you have a list? And I mean like a physical list, not just like a mental list. Like, do you have a list that you can go to that you can look back on and say, hey, God, you showed up here and here and here. You know what? My odds right now, they don't seem great. I'm facing some pretty hard situations, whether financially, physically, health situations, marriage is hard, relationships are hard. But God, I've seen how you've worked in my life. I've seen how you softened my heart in certain situations that I knew my heart was hard. I've seen how you showed up for me financially and how you blessed me in different ways. I've seen how you've worked in my family's lives and in my wife's lives and my lives to bring us together. Like, how can we be continue to work in these ways to have confidence about who our God is and how he's going to step forward in our lives? For one, I encourage you, if you don't have a list, make a list. For me, honestly, I've heard stories from my, grand, my grandparents. They have stories about how God showed up to their lives. And, they, and they, those are stories that they purposely told me. And I remember them. I have stories of constantly of how God showed up in my grandfather's life and says, you know what? Yeah, finances were short. These things happened. And randomly, there was a time where my grandma, like she had, um, she has dentures in the middle of a mall. They show up and someone asked them, like, do you wear dentures? And they're like, no. And the finances were short. Or, she, or they asked her, do you wear dentures? And she's like, yes. She's like, will you do this ad for us that like, and we'll like record you and we'll like use you as an example. And they like paid her. And it was like exactly what they needed in the moment, which was something that something seems like, okay, this is a crazy dumb story, but like these are the moments that like was like a cornerstone moment of God, we're trusting you in these situations. We're trusting you with our lives. We're trusting you with our future. And these are like something that I still hold on to. Something that I still remember. So my encouragement, make a list, write it down on your phone, piece of paper, I don't care, and then share them. But then also I would continue to encourage you and think about, okay, God, I want to live my life in such a way here in the future, in the future. But again, the way we can prepare ourselves in the future is by seizing the moments that are right here in front of us today. So I guess my other prayer for you is, God, how can you use me today? How can I influence those around me that are right around me? Whether it's your coworkers, whether it's the people you work for, whether it is your, your spouse, your friend, your family. And say, God, how can you use me to set an example of what it looks like to walk out in courageous faith and confidence in whom our God is? So that's kind of what I have for you today. I'm going to pray for us and then I'll break up into the time, I guess, of some. Uh, questions if you have some uh dear heavenly father lord we just come to you today uh and we thank you uh, we thank you for being our god we thank you for being our king and we thank you for being our savior uh lord you do work in some pretty magnificent wonderful amazing ways and sometimes we live our lives in such ways that sometimes sadly um we forget who you are we forget that you are our god that you're our deliverer our rescue our safe place our fortress we forget that you are the creator of heaven and earth and you know the number of stars in the, in the sky. You know the number of hairs in our head. You know the stars by name. Sometimes we lose that. But the amazing thing is, is 
in spite of these times when we forget, in spite of the times when we get distracted, in spite of the times that we just don't live up the standard you set. Lord, you look down on us and say, I love you. I hear you. I'm right here with you. I'm walking with you in these moments. I'm going to give you the faith and the courage and the confidence. Be able to step into these moments with a lot of courage, with a lot of faith. And I will show up here in your life here today. So, Lord, would you use all these men in this room? My prayer is, is again, would we walk out of here uh, with a sense of confidence and a sense of, I guess, of hope. And not only of how you're going to work in our future, that we can, that we can continue to look forward and hope to these moments. Um, but also we can say, you know what, God, would you use me here today? Would you use me here now in the present moment uh, in my lives? And I wasn't need to have the ability to influence those around me. So Lord, we love you. In your name. Amen. So my understanding now is Q&A time. Is that correct? Does anyone have any thoughts, questions for me? Uh, verse 13, verse 23, or 22. So on the day of battle, not a soldier with Saul or Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. You're welcome. Can you emphasize a little bit on the uh, talk about the preparation and mindset of Samuel and Jonathan or preparation in our own lives? Both? Yes. Okay. Um, so, again, when I was trying to read this story, I, again, I was inspired by Jonathan because I look at him and go, hey, this is a man with a lot of courage, a lot of confidence. And it doesn't really make me ask these questions like how can, how does he prepare for this? Um, and from my personal opinion, from what I've gathered from the text, he kept his focus more on God than his circumstances. And like in the middle of his circumstances, like there were these moments in the past that it seems to me that Samuel is pushing towards the entire people of Israel that says, hey, I need you to hold on to this. Like you're going to get distracted. You want a king. You want these different things. And he's a son of a king, which means he's technically next in line. Like he doesn't get it. He ends up dying. David becomes king. Um, and the crazy thing is, Jonathan still in it, like what David's story is, he doesn't even necessarily want to be king. Like he knows David's going to be king and he even is willing to give it up. And again, I, some of that I think goes back to those things that Samuel says of this thing and this desire for a king, isn't it like you're, you took your focus off of God. And what Jonathan sees and I've seen in his life is he was more focused on who God is and his confidence in him that allowed him to step into these some of these difficult situations and do this and not get any credit. Um, because if you, if you look at the story of Jonathan, he never gets any credit. Like you look in chapter 13, at this point in chapter 13, actually, I didn't have time to say this in my message, but they have 3,000 men at this point. Saul has 2,000. Jonathan has 1,000. Jonathan goes in. He conquers a portion of the Philistines. And then in, I think 13.5, it says the report was Saul went and conquered and defeated. Not Jonathan. Like his father still got the credit. And then here in this story, he does something crazy. At the end of the chapter, it says the Lord saved Israel, not Jonathan. And then still after that, you would think that his own father would be like, hey, you did a great job. Um, after this story that we just did, that he goes into it, Saul almost kills him. Uh, um, throughout Jonathan's life, and I think, and I, obviously I don't know Jonathan. <laughs> I can't be like asking a question, but it seems to be, he's like, okay, God, if, if you're the one I'm serving, it doesn't really matter who I am. It doesn't matter like my job title. It doesn't matter if I'm a son of a king or the king. Um, I'm here to serve. So that's, I would say, for our own lives and preparation mindset of, again, I'm, I'm a strong believer in writing down stories on how God's worked in your lives. 
Maybe you've heard them called Ebenezer's. Maybe you've heard them called like these like stepping stones. You see in the Bible where they build an altar, they build stones, they name it. They look at it. They're like, you need to remember this. Um, I believe we do the same thing. So whether it's um, writing it down, I'm also a believer that you can make Ebenezer's things. I think you can buy something, a photo. Um, uh, I have a lighthouse on my, like a little lighthouse that sits on my bookshelf because like I'm one of my desires for my life is I want to be a lighthouse. So I have that on my, on my shelf and my bookshelf being a reminder to me when I look at it, being like, Hey, this is who I'm supposed to be. Um, so that's, I've heard other people like when God showed up in a specific way with their finances or other things, they specifically bought something to hang on a wall. Um, so, so then when they look at it, they're like, Oh, I have a physical reminder. Hey, God showed up for me here. Um, so I think those are some of the ways that are both preparation for us as we, okay, where is our focus? Is our focus more on God in these circumstances or are they focused on the actual circumstances? And like, how can we remember how God did show up to allow us to prepare for the future? So the key is to focus on the future. Yeah, I would say so. You're welcome. Any other thoughts or questions? I know I got five minutes technically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. I do think that it is, especially for families and legacies. We all we all do leave a form of a legacy, especially when it comes to like faith. Um, it is all a personal decision. We can't control factors. We can't move the chess pieces. Um, but uh, I do believe in the strong power of prayer. Um, so I just continue to encourage you to keep praying. But sometimes you think that as you read these stuff like that, we don't consider them being real. Hmm. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And I, I'll add to that. I agree. Like, again, miracles are to show the enemy who God is. Um, but also, like, there's a balance. Like, God is the one who works. In Romans chapter 16, verse 20, it says, uh, the Lord will stomp Satan underneath our feet, which I find really interesting. Um, because obviously in and Genesis chapter three, we get the idea of like the first gospel message that it says, like the serpent will be crushed underneath your feet, which is ultimately Jesus' heel is what it's saying. He'll bite your heel, but he will crush your head. Um, but then in Romans chapter 16, 20, near the end of the Bible, he's saying, but guess what? Satan's also going to be crushed under yours. Um, that we have some sort of authority and power in our own lives when we start to work this out in the authority of God. Um, but these divine moments, what I also think is really important is divine mo I didn't say this earlier, so thank you for bringing this back up. Divine moments are often uh, selfless thoughts. They're often directed towards others. Um, it also also affects others. So Jonathan, he does this individually, and it affects the entire nation of Israel. Um, throughout the Bible, these divine moments that take place when we like defeat the enemy, if he's working in our lives, it can affect our family. It can affect those around us. Um, but what it sometimes causes in our own lives is the divine moments uh, also cause the greatest form of surrender. Um, they cause you to go to the end of yourself, the end of your fear, the courage. And it brings you to that kind of like what's end to the point of saying, okay, God, like if you, again, if you don't show up, 
this is not possible. Um, but that's also, again, where I believe God specializes. <laughs> so it takes a lot of fur courage and a lot of faith, but I think that that's where God does his best work. Okay. It is 7.59, I believe. Thank you very much. You dismissed? Do I dismiss? Thank you.